Hey there friends, Dave Elias, k Missing Project, copyrighted edition for our video channel. Well, it's been an interesting couple days here in Montana. Pretty epically beautiful yesterday, and uh, Angie and I took off, went to the eastern side of Glacier National Park. And we left Whitefish, drove on the highway, following the middle fork of the Flathead River. We got across and got into East Glacier. And we had planned to take a hike through a special part of the park. And I'll let you look at it on a map. It's called Iceberg Lake. 10 mile hike round trip, uh, significant elevation gain. And it's called Iceberg Lake for a reason. There's a lot of icebergs on it. And we take these trips for a reason. First of all, clears your mind. Yesterday, there were not many people on the trail. We were fortunate. And we also knew that starting July 1st, it was going to require a permit to get into this area of the park. So we did something different. Normally, get up early in the morning, pack our stuff, grab a breakfast on the way over, get on the trail by 8.30 or 9 in the morning. Get off the trail by 2 or 3 in the afternoon. A lot of times in those high mountain areas, get a lot of rain in the afternoon and thunderstorms. Well, what happened was is that check the advanced weather, no rain. So we just said we had a lot to do the night before. We got up a little late, got going. I go in late, had a nice lunch, hit the trail, didn't get on the trail till three o'clock. And it was about a two and a half, three hour hike in. It's always quicker coming out. And this is a high altitude alpine lake. I looked really hard, I didn't see any fish in it, nothing was jumping, lots of icebergs in it. But I'll show you a photo I took. This is uh, Angie, and you can see the backdrop is just stunning. And I mean stunning, getting up there. That wasn't even to the lake. That was just the, that was the trail up. This is the bowl that the lake sits in. And, This is the lake, and you can see the icebergs that sit in it. There are some huge ones. Now, because it sits in a significant bowl, I mean, it's surrounded by high elevation cliffs, it doesn't get much sun. And sometimes the icebergs never leave. Water stays really cool, really cool. We were up there, and there was a man and his boy. We started a conversation and the man was from the Philippines. And on the way up, we met some young kids that were coming down and they had said that they'd gone for a swim in the lake in the afternoon when the sun was on it for maybe a half an hour. They said it was bitterly cold. I'm thinking that's insane, but... So when we get there, this guy started talking to him. He's from the Philippines, he and his son. Spoke really good English. He says, uh, and maybe I could swim out to that iceberg. I go, eh, it's a pretty long swim. So he takes his shoes off, gets in up to his knees for about 10 seconds and comes out and goes, my whole lower body started to quiver and started to seize up. I said, yeah, you can't do this. I'm th I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, what do I, what do, I do if the guy goes under when, and he's halfway to the iceberg? Am I going to risk my life to save his? <laughs> Luckily, he didn't do it. And there was only about five or six people around the lake when we got there. Now, on the way up, there's a lot of hiker etiquette that goes on. And what I mean by that is that there's a lot of conversations that go on. People coming down, we're going up, small trail. Each people, people stop, talk to each other. We talked to a lot of people on the way up. And... 
so main question is, hey, are there any uh, bears on the way up so we can make more noise, more noise as we're on the trail so we don't surprise a bear? And they said, yeah, there were six bear up there, a couple of grizzlies. Um, okay, that's cool. So we go up there, don't see any bear, but that's okay. Um, didn't see any bear at all. And in fact, didn't see any wildlife. The uh, Iceberg Lake, I would encourage you to take it. It's one of the, I wouldn't say it's easy. I don't, don't take what I say at these high altitude hikes when I say easy. First of all, if you're wearing boots, wear them for a couple weeks, hiking around your neighborhood before you ever wear them in the mountains. Tell people where you're going. Carry a hard copy map. This, tra this trail is very, very well marked. And carry a personal locator beacon. And yes, Angie had bear spray, I had bear spray, we carried an extra canister of bear spray, and I was carrying a big gun. Now just out, well, correct that, inside the park, along the middle fork of the Flathead River, there was a guide service that was floating the river, and it was an overnight trip. So they stopped on the bank inside the park, set up tents. In the middle of the night, a woman was attacked by a grizzly bear and uh, came back a couple times. They were able to fend it off, called for uh, emergency first aid and they got her out. She survived. Hiking in Glacier National Park is not a joke. And if you're a parent, you do not let your kids get out of your sight ever. Uh, and on the hike yesterday, we saw two lone females on the hike going up. They were coming down. Uh, one person, I didn't see any bear spray on them. Completely stupid. Completely stupid. And I've stated many times that people who get attacked by grizzly bear are usually lone hikers, single hikers. Bears are smart. They see a group of people, they won't go after one person. The more numbers in the group, the less of a chance anyone's going to be attacked. So when we were going up, a lot of times we were within eyesight of a group, another group that was going up just because they were near us. You gotta be smart, folks. You have to be smart. And then there's a video on here I made about what to put in your backpack. Please go to it, watch it, pay attention. Always carry a raincoat at high elevations because you never know. When we were coming out of the park, so it stays, it stays light here until, I mean, very light out till 9.30 at night. And it's still light out at 10 o'clock this time of year. Um, we were coming out, we are getting off the trail about 8.30 and just the last mile it started to sprinkle very lightly. But always, always, always carry a raincoat when you're hiking in the high, high back country, no matter what the weather forecast says. Hypothermia can set in very quickly. Now, the story I'm going to read to you today is a very important one. It's very important to me. It involves missing 411, the UFO connection. I've stated before, family members think I'm crazy. They've never read my books. They've watched one or two movies, but they think I'm nuts. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. A lot of friends, a lot of relatives think what I do is crazy. They think that UFOs aren't real. They don't think UFO abductions are real. They don't think that there's anything to the missing 411 books I've written. And these people have disowned me. Very, very close family members won't even talk to me. Somebody sent me a letter the other day. And the letter involved an article about my movie, Missing 411, The UFO Connection. Never mentioned the movie. 
but it mentioned somebody in the movie that nobody really knew, and that was Pat McGuire. Pat owned a very small ranch up in Wyoming. In the movie, we highlighted his story. He was deceased. The story involved Pat The story involved Pat not being able to find water on his farm. And it was essentially going to put him out of business because it was so dry. And he had a visitation from a UFO. And the aliens told him, you dig right here and you're going to find water. So he calls a drill company and they say, you're an idiot. There's no water here. That's why nobody's been here for 300 years. And based on the topography, there's no water here. Drilling will cost you a fortune. We're not going to waste your money. We're not drilling here. Pat thought, thought that was odd. But he was destined. So he went out and bought a big engine and built his own drill. And he drills. Takes him about two or three weeks. And he doesn't hit water. He hits a gusher. And part of the story of why it's in my movie is you'll understand because I lay it out for you. It was amazing. So when a film crew came out to talk to Pat at one time, they actually filmed UFOs over his ranch. This is true. And in the movie, we talked about all of this. This article really touched my heart. This is it. It said, my dad was a famous alien abductee. I thought he was a joke. No, I'm not so sure. Written by David Rydell, June 26, 2023. There's one, veil, there's one video available on the internet concerning my dad, Pat McGuire. It's strange. Uploaded to YouTube 15 years ago, though clearly, though clearly recorded much earlier. The video frames another TV screen. There's constant static and the image, image is fractured as if the broadcast comes from far away. My father is discussing cattle mutilations under hypnosis. He says, we come up on a cow that was dead. They cut the nose off, tongues out, sex organs were gone. He recounts as though he was sleepwalking through a nightmare. He goes on to describe in great detail a spaceship that landed on his ranch and took members of his herd. Their, distance, their distant, terrified animal cries filling those dark prairie nights. One comment below the video reads, having lived and worked with cowmen, can you imagine this guy going to town after this got out publicly? I mean, there's a, they are a finicky bunch to say the least. I started to read this and I thought, this could be about me and what I do. And it took this man a lifetime to come around and accept maybe what his dad was saying was true. Keep going. I don't have to imagine. I grew up with him walking through our small western town. His life by then fractured like that broadcast. He was completely destitute, picking through my classmates garbage. And when a classmate came to school the next day and told me what they saw, their grin and subsequent laughter left little to the imagination. However, I then joined in with their laughter. That, that commenter was right. We are a finicky bunch, to say the least. On May 14, 2009, my dad passed away at a Colorado hospital due to cancer. He was 67. I did not speak to him before he died. My God. What is wrong with some people? What if there's just a 1% chance that what Pat McGuire was saying was true. You as a family member will talk to him? What about me? What if there's just a 1% chance that what I'm saying about all this is true? His last years were spent in homelessness. 
though he hadn't always lived that way. His last words, so I heard, were about grand conspiracies and sinister deep states, though he hadn't always spoken about such topics. My father's legacy in our small Wyoming town and inside our family is stained with his tales of alien abduction, interstellar prophecy, and the insistence he was chosen, though he had, though he had not always been chosen. There was a time before my birth when he was obsessed with the lore of his rural community, the spiraling complexities of his high school dances, and the schemes of enlarging his Roman Catholic family. He was normal, caring, and complete. That was before the stars came knocking. I know a lot of abductees have had their lives greatly disrupted. by being abducted. It changed them. And if you don't understand the complexity of that, and you as a child, or uncle, or aunt, or brother, or sister, are walking away from these people, that's obscene. Back to the letter. When I first saw the bold headline, quote, intelligence officials say U.S. has received and retrieved craft of non-human origin, published June 5th, 2023, in the debrief, I initially didn't think about whether the headline was true. I didn't contemplate what the other crafts might look like of the non-native human variety. It was just another euphemism for the same thing we have been talking about since 47. I thought about my father. I can see him now as though he were alive today. Black cowboy hat, tilted, face tanned, and cracked from high plain sun saying, who's laughing now? I'm not laughing anymore, but not because I know what that headline is saying is absolutely true and proof lives just around the corner. I'm not laughing because I should never have laughed in the first place. The ranch that once belonged to Patrick McGuire, the author's father claimed this was his that was visited by aliens. In 2017, the New York Times broke news about a previously unknown Pentagon department, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. The department was involved in investigating what were formerly called UFOs now referred to as unidentified aerial phenomena. I still call them UFOs. More shifting euphemisms and acronyms for us to track. Since then, the news surrounding these phenomena has steadily grown. There was a congressional hearing in 2022, the creation of a governmental department called the All Domain Anom Anomaly Re Resolution Office. And now a new whistleblower, former intelligence official and AATIP task force member David Grush, claims a government cover-up. These programs are retrieving non-human technical vehicles, call it spacecraft, if you will. Non-human exotic or origin vehicles that have either landed or crashed, he stated. What once seemed to be the premise for the next X-Files reboot has become front page news, gaining mainstream consideration by the serious, the rational, and the institutional. I really have a tough time reading this as I go because since I was a young boy, I was reading about UFOs. Some people are so blurred by the news media, mainstream media, and only believe what they will tell you. You need to read, not watch. Read books. It's strange to be here in the cultural movement. I think many people feel that to some degree, whether this is all true or not. It is unmooring to read that U.S. Senator Kristen Hillebrand from New York is demanding disclosure on a subject that only a decade ago would have been political suicide to even mention. To read that Pentagon official Lou Elizondo state 
My personal belief is that there's a very compelling evidence that we may not be here alone. It's surreal and stranger still is reading about governmental UFO agencies and black money. D.W. Paselka, author of the 2019 book, American Cosmic, an exploration of our cultural interaction with UFO phenomena recently referred to a specific whistleblower event and the preceding media coverage as a paradigm shift. That is, she explained there's a huge pressure from the fringe, then marginal sources that finally initiate a shift in consciousness. The stigma against people who believe in UFOs may go back to the very birth of the topic itself. When the first reports of the UFOs described by Ken Arnold went from saucer to disc to pie pan to sensational terms like flying saucers, Arnold stated, quote, I have, of course, suffered some embarrassment here and there by misquotes and misinformation, end of quote. From there, the subject expanded to include tropes like anal probes, stock characters in films living their lonely manic lives in houses, crisscrossed with spider webs and yarns. Abductees have been satirized on Saturday Night Live beer commercials. Even Harvard psychologist Richard McNally stated in his past clinical research into the abduction phenomena that, quote, it occasionally took a researcher researcher several tries to record these abduction narratives properly. He would sometimes burst out, burst out laughing while trying to record these stories with the necessary solemnity. End of quotes. Insincerity and mockery has shrouded the subject through the NASA recently shared a hearing that the stigma associated with reporting UFO sightings, as well as the harassment of people who work to investigate them, may be hindering efforts to determine their origins. Of course it does. Of course it does. Harvard psychiatrist John Mack started to interview abductees. His own staff ridiculed him. They made fun of him. That really pissed me off. Mack was a good man. He was trying to get inroads to understand this. And eventually he wrote some great books about it. He didn't care about the stigma. He was trying to get to the truth. I know, this, I know that stigma well, having experienced it from both sides. My father was born and raised in Wyoming and was a rancher like his father and his grandfather. He nestled into a Western community that branded their cattle and youth alike with abstract symbols that found definition in the regularity of rain and saw acreage as an appropriate subject to discuss openly. Quote, asking about the size of a man's spread is like asking to look in his checkbook, he said to me once laughing. And one locally... Um, and one local recently told me, quote, he could break a horse like nobody's business. He was a real sharp like that. Shame what happened to him. End of quotes. Shame what happened to him. It wasn't Pat's fault. No. Yeah, it's a shame what happened. My father saw UFOs, not once. Once, like a dinner guest might claim after a few glasses of wine but many times. Numerous UFOs all at once, up close, lingering in the western Wyoming sky like a nightmare that refused to dissipate come sunrise. In 81, on NBC's primetime show, That's Incredible, my father's story gained national attention as he related under hypnosis the specifics of his abduction claims and demands aliens had made upon his life. On March 5, 1980, airing on ABC's Eyewitness News, he reported that UFOs had landed on his ranch, quote, somewhere around 25 or 30 times, end of quotes. And witnesses present were quoted as saying they saw, quote, two or three of them land at separate times. We stayed and watched the sun come up, and we saw two of them in daylight hovering in two separate places, end of quotes. A headline in the March 24, 81 National Enquirer reads, quote, farmer aliens use my ranch as their landing place, end of quotes. And it reports that local newspaper and television reporters have also seen strange lights darting across the McGuire Ranch. Fact. Fact. What else did Pat have to prove of what was happening to him? Newspeople saw it. They got it on camera. Hundreds of others had seen it. Why would his family walk from him, his son? Why?
There appeared to be no shortages of, of witnesses on what was happening on his land. Quote, while we cannot be certain of what we saw, end of quotes, Casper Star Tribune investigative reporter Greg Bean wrote June 29, 1980, quote, None of us left the McGuire farm with as much skepticism as we arrived with. Perhaps we can return, end of quotes. My father's claims continued under hypnosis with famous UFO psychologist R. Leo Sprinkle. Talked about Dr. Sprinkle and Pat in our film. He recounted abductions by star people who demanded his actions in conjunction with their plan for humanity. These star people told him of coming climate apocalypse. Following this hypnosis in a mere handful of years, he was completely destitute without home or family, and he claimed that governmental forces were keeping him that way because of what he saw and said. The story is a regular in the UFO community. In fact, the story of Grush, the whistleblower, is no surprise to that community. The folks who did believe and respect my father, covert conspiracies, recovered craft, Nazi research, and non-human origins, almost everything the whistleblower related, my father related to me in similar fashion at some point in life. And his son didn't want to listen. Same thing happened to me and my family. No, not with Ben. <laughs> ben was a critical thinker. Ben knew what I was saying was right. Stood right next to me. He made the movie. Made our first movie, Missing 411. From the earliest points of my childhood, I was told that UFOs were nothing to make light of. At every turn, every nightfall, through any locked door, the star people could take anyone, even me. My father's description of the star people and my subsequent nightmares matched what our culture has come to expect. Five foot hairless beings with eyes like colorless pools hovering at my bedside. Soon classmates and teachers alike were smirking at my fears. And then like any sociological contagion, I began to smirk too. Then TV took over from my teachers in South Park, Coneheads and Mars Attacks, taught me that this was indeed a laughing matter. My brothers and I laughed when our father talked about the implants, their accompanying pain. We laughed when he claimed we could, he could barely walk after what the star people did to him. We laughed when he said that he was suing the government for the land they took from him, for destroying his life, for destroying our lives. We laughed. The world laughed. No, I did not laugh. If you are not one to laugh about UFOs, then you didn't take, then you didn't, huh then you didn't say anything at all. And if you did, you hesitantly considered the person you were talking to first, making sure they would not laugh at you too, before you said anything at all. For many, it was a precarious high wire. If one was to discuss the trauma of the phenomena or its reality. When we weren't getting our meals in school, my father often took us to a local soup kitchen in a basement bunker in our town, in our town's Episcopal Cathedral. I remember best the dampness of the walls and the claustrophobia of dining elbow to elbow, to elbow with other folk, weathering financial storms, breaking expired bread to share over lentil soup. We're often the only children in attendance. For most of the diners, this was the last place to go. The person across from me would make small talk between spoonfuls, but nothing of the weather or local gossip. In the soup kitchen, the talk was of remote viewing reverse engineering and tapping into the collective unconscious of cosmic spiritual growth. I would nod with feigned excitement and encourage them to go deeper. What about the face of Mars, I would ask with a smile. My brothers and I often failed to contain our laughter. What that did to Pat. As the world contemplates Gresh's claim, I'm the one who feels ashamed. These potential findings mean only one thing to me. An accounting must be made. How should we address our past mockery and ridicule as it turns out that, hidden in a desert base somewhere, there are indeed crafts, cadavers, and photographs of strange visitors. Regardless of the origins of the metallic orbs, tic-tac crafts, saucers, and independent of the validity of Gresh's claims, we should feel impelled to investigate and rescue a community living with the trauma of the unknown and indescribable. 
a community community that we greeted with sneers this decision for so long a community we push to the outskirts of our cultural limits to safely ignore if it is all true or it is all lies and sickness we should approach both valuations with care and consideration even skepticism but not with the intense ridicule so many of us have given them for so long I cannot say for certain that a shift in the wider cultural acceptance of UFOs is already occurring in our institutions as some have begun to state, but I can report what has occurred to my own consciousness. Since the 50s, intrepid investigators have spent their whole lives and careers dedicated to the phenomena of UFOs and abductions, and here we are, possibly closer to the truth than ever, and yet I somehow feel no closer to understanding my dad. I was not at his side while he lay on his deathbed by choice, a choice I seemingly made as a child and never reassessed. I chose not to hear his last words. It's hard for me to accept. Quote, although delusions are commonly encountered in schizophrenia and attract affective disorders, it turns out that anyone can have them. Mazarin Banaji and John Kilstrom stated in 1996 research titled The Ordinary Nature of Alien Abduction Memories. Quote, they are natural byproducts of our attempts to explain the unusual things that can happen to us. As has been the tradition with this topic, I have little certainty about what happened to my father. I can only say that something unusual happened to him. Then he spent the rest of his life trying to make sense of it. And now I will spend the rest of my life trying to make sense of him. David Rydell, born and educated in Bossler, Wyoming, as a University of Wyoming graduate student, whose writing often examines the realities of abduction and mental illness inside this strange, frightening world we all inhabit. In 2021, he won the Tory Award for his novella submission, Terrestrial Issues, and his short stories, The Space Beneath and The Body, have been published in the Worm Moon Archive Literary Magazine. David. You don't know everything. I don't know everything. But the difference between you and I is I'm willing to dig deep and let my critical thinking skills take over. Your dad died a lonely man. We, as parents, value our kids like you have no understanding. When you turned from your dad and you laughed at your dad, I was a gut punch like you just don't know. First of all, you didn't include everything in here, in that article, that I know about your dad, that I put in the movie. Why didn't you do that? Sure would have offered a lot of validation to your dad about where he drilled for water and what he found. But you didn't do that. I have no idea why. I'm sure he's watching, David. I put his story in the movie to give it validation. Heck, a hundred miles away, one of the most famous alien abduction stories of our time were in our movie. He didn't talk about that. Wyoming being a hot spot for UFOs. The Air Force Base, the sightings, the official reports, he didn't include that either. I did in our movie. You need to get over this, David. You need to get past it. There's something in your inner soul that doesn't allow you 
to think critically about this topic. The way you treated your dad is exactly the way some of my relatives are treating me. It guts me. It hurts me every day. I hope we meet someday, David. I would never say anything mean to you. I try to get you to understand how a simple man like your dad could possibly have dealt with what happened to him. Who does he turn to? Who does he go to for help in the middle of Wyoming? Yeah, the aliens dealt him a card that he couldn't win with. His only hope was the support of his family. I understand that. I was fortunate I had that support from Ben. There's kids out there watching, relatives, friends. You're in this position. 1% rule. If there's a 1% chance that the story is true, then you as a compassionate, feeling human being needs to give your friend, relative, the benefit of the doubt. And then if you're unwilling to give them the respect and dignity they need and deserve, and you're unwilling to dig deep on that topic, then you keep your mouth shut. Because if there's just a 1% chance that the story they're saying is true, what if you were in that position of being ostracized and alone and lonely? Light us out.